This is a TV show called Caleb and Sophia. It's produced by Jehovah's Witnesses. I've decided to go through the entire series again. I have them all put into compilations so that I'm going to cover every single episode again. And this next episode I wanted to cover is titled Jehovah Will Help You Be Bold. Now, before we watch it, I want to give you a little context to how they expect children to act, what they expect from kids. Because this TV show, Caleb and Sophia, is designed to show children how to act and what to do. This is Stephen Led. He's a governing body member. This is generally how they view anybody outside the religion, not just children, but obviously that's how they view children too. Now, if we think about it, we're not born as friends of God because we're born as sinful offspring of Adam. Actually, if you think about it, we're born as enemies of God. Sometimes you'll hear people say of a little baby, look at that little angel. But more accurate would be to say, look at that little enemy of God. So they're trying to prep children to not be little enemies of God with this Caleb and Sophia video. So let's give this a watch and uh, see what lesson they had to give in this video. It's just cringy and terrible. Okay, let's start from the beginning. We're going to watch the whole thing. The animation is really good. This is before they completely destroyed the animation. They changed the way they do it, and I feel like the new animation is terrible. <clears throat> ah, so Sophia is getting ready for school here, and she's putting her, her unmarked school books in her school bag and she thought about whether or not to put her bible story book in there if you're unfamiliar with the bible story book oh my god dude oh it's bad you know what i thought that was a bible story book apparently that's not the bible story book yeah this is just a book for kids about Jesus and Jehovah's Witnesses and all that stuff. My mistake. They do have a different Bible story book that looks very similar to this, though, I believe. Anyway, so this is just like a list of Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs, pretty much. That's the book she's giving her right now. This is the old one that I had when I was a kid, and it's, it's, it's just straight-up haunting, dude. I don't even know what else to call it. It's haunting. It's got some really haunting imagery in it about God killing people and destroying things and babies crying and, you know, Cain and Cain killing Abel in this hurry. And I remember looking at this when I was, I don't know, how old was I? Maybe uh, four or five. I remember looking at this picture here and thinking to myself, is this blood or is this a hole in the ground? And realizing, disturbingly, this is blood. They're depicting blood here. This is blood I'm looking at. Anyway, they had some whacked out stuff in this. And it just basically tells every story in the Bible. The story of Noah's flood. And look, look at this. This is the kind of thing you find in Bible story books from Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. What did the mammoths do? Apparently the mammoths are up here with the, the woman and the baby sitting on a rock and they're about to drown to death seriously children read this okay and that's what sophia here is debating to take to school to read that is some wild sh man some wild stuff right there for real and she's like well should i bring this to school the answer is no sophia don't bring that to school that is entirely too over the top i haven't looked at the new version this is a new version i had the old version i had the yellow one this is such an iconic like image right here anybody who is over the age of maybe 20 years old knows what this is and remembers it and is burned into their their retina at this point anyway i haven't really gone through the new one but my mom gave my kid one of these new ones when she was younger
Okay, she decides to take the uh, my book of horror stories with her, as they call it. Oh, she's reading it on the the bus. Hey, Sophia, what you read? Um. Well, any Jehovah's Witness knows you're supposed to tell the kid what you're reading. And what is wrong with this kid? He's like really, really ugly. Is it just me? He has no defined facial features. There's something wrong with his. It's like his face is stretched out like it's a like like it's Silence of the Lambs and it's not even a real face. Like it's just kind of stretched over his real face. I don't know. There's just something really odd about the way this kid looks. Anyway, as a Jehovah's Witness, she's supposed to tell him exactly what she's reading and not be nervous about it. That's the point of this Caleb and Sophia video. Jehovah will help you be bold. You're supposed to be bold. You're supposed to tell him what you're reading. This is your perfect opportunity to spread the good word about Jehovah's name. And don't forget, if you aren't one of God's people... Now, if we think about it, we're not born as friends of God. You're not a friend of God if you're not one of God's people. You're an enemy of God, remember? Because we're born as sinful offspring of Adam. Actually, if you think about it, we're born as enemies of God. Sometimes you'll hear people say of a little baby, look at that little angel. I'm sorry, this is just a psychotic clip. But more accurate would be to say, look at that little enemy of God. Seriously, does it get more psychotic than this? Well, it does get more psychotic than this. This is another ex-governing body member that, that <laughs> this guy needs help. We're not going to get into it right now. Let's keep listening to Sophia Learn to Be Bold from Jehovah. Hey, Sophia, what you read? Um, hey! Hey, give me my hat back. Okay, so he's distracted, and she didn't have to show him what she was reading. Didn't have to be bold, quote-unquote. Didn't have to be one of God's people, if you will. Oh, yeah, wow, this is a really long one. This is like 12 minutes long, okay. And she feels bad. You see her stepping off the bus? Look at this. She feels like she f***ed up. She feels like she didn't hold up her end of the bargain. Of course, the bargain being God gave her life, so she needs to preach his word from the mountaintops. And she had an opportunity because she's reading her book. That's why Jehovah's Witnesses do that stuff. They read their books in public so people will ask them about them. She was doing that, expecting somebody to ask her. I remember, I was that age and a Jehovah's Witness. I remember that exact thought process. And I remember not telling the kids about it and walking off the bus sad. Eventually, as time went on, I learned to be bold, as they say, and tell the kids at school about it. And I became a pariah. I was f***ing weird because uh, I was that weird religious kid who always had those weird religious books and never took part in birthday parties at school. Never took part in Valentine stuff. You know, they create little pouches for Valentines and everybody gives everyone else a Valentine in class. Not this guy. This guy got to wait in the corner or outside in the hall or at the principal's office when everyone else is getting Valentines. Sophia is already standing out heavily, as every Jehovah's Witness does at school. It's a natural part of the process. Yeah, that was a weird way to show the passage of time, but all right. I, I probably would have put in a crossfade effect, but you, you do you, I suppose. I'm not the animating expert here. And look, there's a, a kid that's all sad and, and downtrodden and unhappy. And Sophia believes that she has the answer to make her happy when, believe me, she doesn't. She does not have the answer. And she believes the answer is the Bible storybook, of course. <gasps> okay, the animation apparently wasn't that good at the time, because some of these character models are, are just strange, dude. 
They look like uh, 1990s Christian character models. I mean, some of the character models are okay. I think this one's okay. And Sophia isn't a bad character model. It could use some work. Like, I feel like the hair has a weird texture to it. All of the hair. Like, not just Sophia's, but this hair too. Anyway, I'm getting off track here. So the point is she's debating whether or not to talk to this very obviously sad person about Jehovah because she thinks it'll make her happy. And everybody around her is staring at her, seeing what she'll do next. She decides not to right now. She failed. She's a failure in Jehovah's Witnesses' eyes. She's depressed now because she didn't do what she, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses wanted her to do, quote unquote. Which is evangelize and spread the good word and blah, blah, blah. Grow their religion for them. I feel so bad for Zoe. This is just whacked out, man. Seriously. When I was a Jehovah's Witness, they used to tell me my territory was the school. Because there are gated communities in the area. I go to school with rich kids. I go to school with poor kids. You know, everybody in that area goes to the same school because it's such a small area, right? Those parents may never be able to hear the word of Jehovah if it weren't for me. So I have to step in and tell the children of these parents about Jehovah. It's my responsibility. Think of the school as my territory. I'm going to school to spread the good word to these kids. And if I don't, what am I doing there? What's the point? That's the way Jehovah's Witnesses viewed it. That's the way they wanted me to view it. And that's the way Sophia views it. That's the reason why she's so depressed. She failed. Now, when she gets home, she gets into this whole thing about feeling bad for Zoe and, and trying to help her and everything. But you keep listening here. Oh, now they use a crossfade. Now they decide to stick a crossfade in to show the passage of time. I don't know what the hell they did with that clock, but okay. I feel so bad for Zoe. Her grandma died. I wanted to tell her about Jehovah, but I got scared. Yeah, good idea. Get scared. That was your internal feelings telling you this is a bad idea. Don't tell a kid whose grandmother just died about Jehovah. Trust me, it's a bad idea. <sighs> I wish I was more brave. Sophia, you can be brave. I mean, this is childhood propaganda. Think about the message they're trying to give to kids right now. Tell you what. Let's work on a little project together. There's a little girl I want you to meet. She needed boldness too. Hey, she looks like me. She's very much like you. What's her name? Well, the Bible doesn't say. This is just cringy and terrible. She's in the Bible? I doubt it's even a real person. A lot of Bible stories aren't even real people. Yes. Why is she scared? She's in a strange place, far from home. Trying to figure out which story this is so I can figure out if it's a real story or not, because some of them are real, some aren't. Moses was not a real person. Moses was credited with writing the book of Deuteronomy. It details his death. How could it possibly have been written by Moses. There's no evidence at all that Moses was real, and there should be. It's things like that, things you take for granted. People that you believed were real just because you grew up here in the stories aren't real. None of it's real. Some Well, let me rephrase. Some of it just isn't real. It's crazy. So anyway, uh, we'll see if we can figure out if this is a real story or not. Surrounded by people who don't worship Jehovah. She's surrounded by people who don't worship Jehovah, okay? Well, nobody worshipped Jehovah because Jays didn't exist back then. They didn't exist till the 1400s. I assume you mean they weren't worshipping Yahweh. Go on. She was taken from her family and forced to work in the home of a mighty warrior called Naaman. Called what? Naaman? Naaman. It's N-A-A-M-A-N, I think. 
Uh, Second Kings 5. Naaman was commander of the army of the, I'm sorry, of the king of Aram. He's a great man. Is there a slave in here somewhere? Okay, I don't have any clue where they're getting this. Naaman. Yeah, Second Kings 5 talks about this apparently. According to the narrative, he's called a Mazora, a person affected by the skin disease Tazarat or Zarat maybe. When the Hebrew, I think it was leprosy at the time. When the Hebrew slave girl who waits on his wife tells her of a Jewish prophet in Samaria who can cure her master, he obtains a letter from King Ben-Hadad II of Aram to King Joram of Israel, in which Ben-Hadad asks Joram to arrange for the healing of his subject Naaman, or Naaman. Naaman proceeds, it's N-A-A-M-A-N, so however you want to pronounce it, I guess. Naaman proceeds with the letter to King Joram. The king of Israel suspects in this, to him, impossible request, a pretext of Syria for later starting a war against him and tears his clothes. Okay, so this is 853 BC. So let me just give a little um, background to what's happening here. Parts of the Bible are real. Parts of it are not. It's hard to know what's what, really. But King David, I don't know if he's a real guy or not. There's no physical evidence that King David was real. But um, I think scholars generally believe that he most likely was real. And he ruled in Israel around 1000 BCE, in that vicinity. So 1000 years before Jesus you know, came to earth and did what he did or whatever. When King David became the king, it was a pretty big deal because the entire area was split into warring sections. You know, you had Judea, where the tribe of Judah, of the tribes of Israel, lived, Judea, and the other tribes lived in Israel itself. They split off from each other. And then you had the Philistines, and you had the... Uh, the Palestinians and the so on and the so forth. And everybody in the area hated everybody else and criticized everyone when David rose to power. Well, David consolidated power and took control of Judea and um, Palestine and the Philistine area and everything. He took control of all of it. So for the first time in, I don't know how long, maybe ever, that narrow strip of land that connected Asia to Africa that is known as like Israel today was controlled by one person, which means if you want to move gold from Africa to Asia or spices from Asia to Africa or whatever, you got to pay them a tax. Up to that point, people who wanted to transport goods between Africa and Asia were just picking the country that would charge them the smallest amount and going through there. But when King David united that whole area, he created a monopoly. Anyway, he was in control around 1000 BCE. And this story happened about 850 BCE, give or take. So it's like 150 years after, da uh, after David's death or, or somewhere in that vicinity. And there was a, a country called Assyria that kept attacking Israel and causing problems for everybody and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, the countries were at war with each other again. And this guy, Naaman, apparently, was in control of the area of Assyria. He was one of the commanders. And he had what I believe to be leprosy. But they didn't know what it was at the time. It was just a weird skin condition to them, you know. And apparently Naaman had taken a Jewish slave girl from the nation of Israel. And this Jewish slave girl told him that her God was so powerful that he could cure Naaman's leprosy, basically. If you just send for the priest, he'll pray over you and he'll fix your problems. Of course, that's complete nonsense. That wouldn't have happened. So they send the letter to the king of Israel and he's like, they're trying to go to war with us right now because this is obviously a ridiculous request. This isn't going to happen. So he like rips his clothes off because he's so angry because he's going to die and lose his kingdom, basically. His conclusion from what just happened from this letter that he received from Naaman. Uh, so I think that's caught us up to the back, you know, the context 
behind this story. So this is the slave girl, I guess, that was taken from Israel and made to serve Naaman. Forced to work in the home of a mighty warrior called Naaman. Well, he was a commander of the Assyrian army, I believe. By the way, everything that I just told you, it's a mix of things that came from the Bible and things that we've established realistically. So just take it as Bible lore more than reality. That's just kind of how the Bible went and I was laying out a timeline for you. Some of the stuff I mentioned didn't have a real basis to believe it. Like it didn't have, there's not physical evidence for any of it. It's just like the biblical storyline, basically. Life as a slave was very hard, especially for a little girl. Which is, yeah, it's totally understandable. You'd think that the Israelites and the people in Judea and everywhere else in that area would take the hint after being enslaved at various points in their history and say, you know what, slavery's wrong, let's not do that. You'd think that they would learn from that experience and say, look, I don't want anyone else to experience what I went through, so we're just going to abolish it. Instead, they put in the Bible that slavery is a good thing, and you should be doing it. It just blows me away. We're not here to talk about that. The warrior was a mighty man. Yeah, Naaman, he was a uh, commander of Assyrian, uh, of the Assyrian army, okay? There was a mighty man and fearless. He had defeated many enemies in battle. But now he was sick. I, again, I think it was leprosy. Yeah, okay, so according to the biblical narrative, it was it was leprosy. I don't know if... This story is real if this is based in fact or what, but a lot of the Bible is not baked based in fact. Uh, you have to find extra biblical sources before believing any of this, but yeah, it was leprosy. What is leprosy? It, it's a uh, bacteria, isn't it? For the record, leprosy in the modern world, in the developed world, has been basically completely abolished. It's not a problem anymore, but it's caused by infection with the bacterium Mycobacterium leprae. So it's a bacterial infection. It mainly affects the skin, eyes, nose, and peripheral nerves. Symptoms include light-colored or red skin patches with reduced sensation, numbness, and weakness in hands and feet. Leprosy can be cured with 6 to 12 months of multi-drug therapy. Early treatment avoids disability. I think eventually it eats away at your skin and your bones and everything until your foot your your extremities just fall off basically it's not good leprosy apparently it's spread through droplets from the nose and mouth prolonged close contact over months with someone untreated is needed to catch the disease so it's not actually it's actually pretty hard to spread unless you like live with the person or you're around them for like long periods of time apparently so Give you a little context on what was happening. He had defeated many enemies in battle. Except man's greatest enemy, the germ. But now he was sick. His illness was like an enemy he could not defeat. Hey, there you go. They, they told my joke for me. No one in the land knew how to help him. No one in the land knew how to help him, huh? Weird. Almost like we needed a little bit of science to solve the problem. Science could have fixed it. We have fixed this problem with science. And what were they relying on back then? They were relying on some deity uh, from some faraway land to solve the problems for them. It's just ridiculous, dude. <gasps> staring at get back to work of course being a slave girl she's not valued remember that this is children's propaganda so it's designed to keep their interest let's just keep thinking about how this is designed to pull children in and send a specific message to them as we go on 
Like some of the character models though are really good, but look, what's up with the cheek here? What's up? It's like her cheek is really, really puffy and big, and her jaw is very narrow. It's it's strange the way they drew the character model. Okay. The master's so sick. There's no hope left in him. None of the gods have cured his illness. Jehovah can. It wasn't Jehovah. Jays didn't exist until the 1400s. It was Yahweh. Okay? Yahweh. Y A H W E H Yahweh. Jehovah can? What did you say? Uh, I said Jehovah. Never say that name here. Don't you know where you are? We don't worship your God of Israel. These are our gods. Okay, they're trying to make fun of it. They're trying to pretend that it's ridiculous to believe in these as gods when you can't see our God. In reality, they lived in an area, you know, Israel, Judea, and Palestine, and so on and so forth. All the, the, the that whole little area there. They worshipped a variety of different gods. They worshipped uh, Baal and Marduk and Yahweh and a whole bunch of of others. The gods that I just named were from the Canaanite pantheon, another group of people that lived in the area the same time the Jews lived in the area. And there was an exchange of religion and culture between the Jews and the Canaanites. The Jews picked up on the Canaanites' worship of their god of metallurgy, Yahweh. He was one of their 12 gods. And the Jews picked him made a covenant with him and said, we will worship you and no other God before you if you promise to protect us in war and blah, blah, blah. They signed a covenant with him. Of course, he wasn't even real. Uh, none of the 12 gods of the Pantheon were real. But the Jews were the only ones in the area that worshipped Yahweh and only Yahweh. And all of the other people in the area, the Canaanites, the Midianites, and the Philistines, and everybody else, they all worshipped various different types of gods or deities or whatever. And sometimes Jews took part in those celebrations because, you know, it's like an atheist celebrating Christmas today. It's something you do. It's just part, part of the culture. It's something that everybody does in the United States, so you might as well take part to some degree. And that infuriated the Jews that existed and said that if they celebrate or even talk about other gods, then Yahweh is going to strike them dead, blah, blah, blah. So that, you know, they developed a serious persecution complex because their fellow Jews in the area at the time were telling them that God was going to kill them if they this or that or whatever. If you're God of Israel, these are our gods. And that's ridiculous, right? Necklaces instead of uh, gods you can't see. But... It just... Uh, this is part of the propaganda. You can see what they're doing here, right? They're trying to make fun of these people's religion by showing how ridiculous it is that somebody would worship a necklace. How ridiculous is that, right? And aside from that, just for the record, at the time, how old is this kid? 10? 12? She wouldn't have been a house servant, probably. If she were a slave, she would have been a very specific type of slave at the time. I'm just saying. I guess they can't, they don't feel they can p depict that, right? But I was just. You must learn to keep silent. <laughs> Oh my God, that song reminds me of, uh, what, what is that song reminding me of? Hotel California. That sounded just like the opener to Hotel California, didn't it? A little bit with a sad tone to it. I assume that's Naaman and he's like crying because he doesn't know how to deal with leprosy. Yeah, it looks like it. No. <laughs> Your father is sick. Uh, I mean, if they're that close to him, it's probably 
you know, if they're in close proximity like that for extended periods of time, you know, it may be too late. Like everybody in that entire house may have already caught leprosy or may be on their way to getting it. No, please, I want to stay. <sighs> Mommy, please. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. no. Oh, my dear. Master. I know what can help. What? Never say that name here. Must not. Side eye. Um, can I get you some more food? And she was afraid. She had to be brave. That's the point they're trying to get to. You gotta be brave and say Jehovah's name, or he won't love you anymore, or some other nonsense. She's saying her prayers to Jehovah. Jehovah, I'm scared. I miss my mom and dad. Mom told me I could always call on you for help, but nobody here wants me to talk about you. Because everybody else in the area had already considered the possibility that maybe Jehovah was real, and then they discounted it immediately because it was a ridiculous idea. He was one of 12 gods in the Canaanite pantheon, Collectively known as the Elohim, all of the 12 gods in the Pantheon, and they were called the Elohim because they were created by the god El. El created the Elohim, which included Yahweh and Baal and blah, blah, blah. Okay, the Elohim were the children of El, a probable parallel to the biblical sons of God. Interesting. The chief god, a progenitor of the universe, was El also known as Elion, the biblical El Elion, who was the father of the divinities. This is real history. This is actually where all of this stuff came from. This isn't like, you know, only from the Bible or whatever. No, this is real. This is where this stuff came from. They made this pact with one of the Elohim, which was Yahweh. But for the record, the Canaanites had a whole bunch of deities. They had Aglabal, Anat, Erse, Arsu. I mean, I'm starting at the very top in the A's. Ashima, Astarte, Asherah. I mean, some of these names you'll probably recognize from the Bible, right? Bela, Belat Jib, uh, Gabal, Azizos, Hadad, Baal Hermon, Baal Hammon. Baal Hermon was titular local deity of Mount Hermon. And Baal Hammon was a god of vegetative fertility and renewer of all energies of ancient Carthage. Baal Shaman, also called Baal Shaman and Baal Shamim, supreme sky of Palmyra, Syria, whose temple was destroyed on the 23rd of August, 2015 by ISIL. Oh, fast. Oh, my God. Really? Apparently a Canaanite temple to a Canaanite god, Baal Shamin, existed until 2015 when it was destroyed by ISIS. I remember when that was happening. I didn't realize that it was destroyed so recently. That's crazy. Anyway, there are just a billion different gods. You know, there's Bethel is apparently one of the gods, one of the, um, the Canaanite gods. He became popular during the Neo-Babylonian Empire in the Syria region and the Sumerian Judean di diaspora settlement of Elephantine Egypt. So anyway, give you a little bit of context there. Yahweh was just one of the many gods that was from the Canaanite pantheon that kind of spread out and became popular in that entire area at the time. Told me I could always call on you for help, but nobody here wants me to talk about you. Jehovah, I know you can help Naaman. Please make him better so he could play with his kids. Please help me be brave so I can tell him about you. Did Jews pray this way back then or was it completely different? I'm not sure. I thought they communicated with God through a prophet exclusively. Am I wrong? Okay, maybe they did pray like that. I'm just not sure. It's, it's hard to know what parts Jehovah's Witnesses twist around out of proportion and which parts they keep faithful to, you know? I 
Okay, that. so this is the like the mom. This is the uh, what do you call it? like the uh, the wife of Naaman, I guess. Never say that name here. You must learn to keep. I know who can help your husband. Who? Jehovah, the God of Israel. It's just painful and stupid. My God. His prophet can heal your husband. He must go to him. And and so she's like, you know what? I don't give a shit. Like nothing's worked so far. I'm gonna try whatever. Is that is that what happened? I mean, you may still be executed, little girl, so I wouldn't be too happy right now. Like, I don't know how many creative liberties Jehovah's Witnesses took with this story either. If they took it directly from the Bible or if they just, you know, they added flair to it or if the story was just like one sentence long, I have no idea. This story could be completely made up. Uh, beyond what I've already told you, just a slave girl told Naaman to go to the prophet. That's it. <laughs> yeah, and they skipped the part where the king thought was like, this is ridiculous. Who could ever expect Jehovah to cure anybody of anything. We've been trying. You think we haven't tried that? There are 15,000 dead bodies piled up back behind me right now who we've been praying for Jehovah to reanimate for two years now. It's starting to smell. And he hasn't done shit for us. And that's why the guy ripped his shirt off. He's like, we've been trying. Why are you sending Naaman to us? You little slave girl. Why are you doing this? You're basically killing us. We have tried this. So anyways, I guess Jehovah's Witnesses just skipped that whole part of the narrative. And uh, Naaman, you know, got his agreement from the king of Israel to come and talk to the prophet. Did that even happen? I don't know. Okay, and now they're doing slapstick comedy for the kids. Great. <laughs> the master has returned. And of course, he's supposedly cured, right? Because uh, the Israelites had that, what was it? That uh, antibacterial medicine that cures it over the course of 12 months, right? Definitely. Oh, my love. And now all of the Assyrians are Yahweh lovers, right? Because those 15,000 soldiers that Naaman slaughtered the year before couldn't be revived or cured or helped in any way by Yahweh. But the guy who slaughtered him, on the other hand, he could be helped for sure. Hug you, Daddy. Of course. Come here. Come here, my son. <laughs> And that's like a reaffirmation of her faith. You know, it's real. It's true. This is part of the propaganda. You know, they're trying to convince children who are watching this Caleb and Sophia video that God performed these miracles in the Bible and that these miracles were real. These things really did happen. Doing everything they can to convince them of it. I mean, it's a ridiculous story. This did not happen. But okay. You know, it's all part of the propaganda. Now I know there is no other God anywhere, only Jehovah. Thank you, little one. You catch that? So they, they took their, uh, you know, these two people, they took their little uh, deities, their little, I, is it a tchotchke-based culture? Is that what it's called? Tchotchke is from the Slavic word for trinket. Oh, and it, apparently it's been used by Jewish Americans for a long time. I had no idea, but... 
the, it's basically the belief that your deities reside inside of these items, these trinkets. I don't even know if this is true. Is this completely made up that these people, the Assyrians, were a tchotchke-based culture? And they're not anymore, I guess. They just throw them behind them. Suddenly they realize that Jehovah or Yahweh is the real God. Okay. Thank you, little one. Thank you for telling me about him. Okay, so back to Caleb and Sophia. The mom has been drawing this this entire time. She didn't. Wow, the mom sucks at drawing. You guys seeing this? Look at this. Could they have picked a, a worse artist to draw stuff for real? I mean, this one's pretty good. This one's really good. The rest of these just suck. And the mom took creative liberties, like a lot of creative liberties here. I don't remember hearing any of this stuff in the Bible or reading any of this stuff in the Bible, but okay. She didn't know what was going to happen after she spoke up. But she knew, no matter what happened, Jehovah would be with her. She was probably going to be killed. She probably would have been killed. And Jehovah will be with you, too, Sophia. <gasps> I'll never be as brave as her. Of course you will, Sophia. You just need a little practice. And then you will be bold, too. Do you remember what we're doing tonight? So they gave Sophia an example of a girl being brave and it turning out well and now are telling Sophia, you need to do the exact same thing. This is all part of the propaganda. What we're doing tonight. Family worship? Right. Maybe tonight we can make a pretend classroom in the kitchen. Oh, and look, the dad's sitting on the chair backwards because he's the cool kid. And uh, Caleb, too. They're both sitting on the chairs backwards. Because that's how cool kids sit. On backwards chairs. Boring kids sit on chairs normally, the way that I am right now. This is me being boring. But if I flipped this chair around and put my legs through the arms, that would make me cool. Just like these guys right here. I can be Zoe. And Dad and Caleb can be the other kids. And of cool, uh, I'm sorry. And of course, cool correlates to jag off. That's J A G O F F. Don't censor me, YouTube. Oh, and uh, and dumb. Apparently, cool correlates to asshole and dumb. If you have any kind of social credit at all, you're an idiot. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses want to get across to their kids. It's all part of the propaganda. You can practice being bold with us. And you don't want social credit. You want to destroy it at all costs and make it all about Jehovah. All of it. Your entire life should be about Jehovah. And your only reason for being at school is to teach people about Jehovah. It's your territory. And then tomorrow, you'll be all set for Zoe. Notice they're putting pressure on her, too. Tomorrow, you're going to be doing this. That's the plan. And if she comes home tomorrow and she's, you know, sad about it, she hasn't done it, she's going to feel the deepest shame she's ever felt in her life. So she prayed to God. Now, this transition, that was actually a really smooth transition. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but, it, it, you know, everything just kind of changed. It wasn't exactly a crossfade. It was like things appeared. That was beautiful. I love that animation. So anyways, she's in the classroom. She said her little prayer to Jehovah. And uh, now she's going to talk to Zoe about God. See, honestly, this is one of the most predatory things about Jehovah's Witnesses, in my opinion. The fact that they see somebody who's just lost someone who's really close to them, a grandmother or a parent or a brother, sister, aunt, uncle, whatever. They find the people who have lost somebody important to them, and they prey upon them. They're extremely predatory, and they use children to prey upon them. Disgusting. I thought I couldn't be brave, but I learned from the little Hebrew girl. She was just like me. 
And Jehovah helped her be brave. You notice they call her the little Hebrew girl rather rather than the little Jewish girl when she, in fact, was Jewish, but they don't want to promote the religion of Judaism, so they call them Hebrews instead of Jews. Kind of an interesting little thing. Every word in this is scripted carefully and exactly. Looks like me. And Jehovah helped her be brave. I'm sorry about your grandma. This is for you. It will help you feel better. Learn from the great teacher. You know what? Is this the Bible story book or is this a different one? You know what? I thought that was a Bible story book. Apparently that's not the Bible story book. Yeah, this is just a book for kids about Jesus and Jehovah's Witnesses and all that stuff. My mistake. They do have a different Bible story book that looks very similar to this, though, I believe. Anyway, so this is just like a list of Jehovah's Witnesses beliefs, pretty much. That's the book she's giving her right now. It will help you feel better. Thank you. It's not going to make her feel better. See ya. Bye. In fact, she's probably going to throw it in the trash in, in five minutes. But you know what? Sophia placed a book. That's what matters. When I say placed a book, I'm sorry, I should probably elaborate. That's Jehovah's Witness speak for gave a book to somebody. Seriously. There's a whole sheet that you have to fill out every month as an, un an unbaptized publisher or as a baptized publisher, as a Jehovah's Witness that describes how many books you gave to people and how many hours you went around talking to them about Jehovah and the whole nine yards. This is the old uh, timesheet that I used to use, a service report. You know, the, you'd put the date down, uh, you'd put how many books you placed, how many booklets and brochures, how many hours of field service you had knocking on doors or preaching the good word or whatever, how many individual magazines you gave out, how many return visits you have, how many people you have that you have to go back to and they track all of it and they give you, you know, you got a total that you give to the service overseer at the end of the month and they watch and see how many people you convert per hour of field service and blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know if they have, if the, the timesheets like been updated or what, but yeah, this is the one that I used personally when I was in it. Sophia just placed a book with this with this girl and she can mark down on her timesheet five minutes an additional five minutes honestly i probably would have counted all the time i spent prepping for it too i i i put down i put down time i didn't even do because i didn't want them to think i was inactive if you put down zero hours or you don't turn in a service report they'll come after you they'll come ask for that service report and um if you just don't turn one in, then you're considered inactive. If you don't turn one in for, I think, like three months or something. I don't remember. Somebody says, what's the point of that? The point is to track how many Jehovah's Witnesses are active within the religion, really, and to find out who you should and should not be hanging out with uh, within the congregation. Who is a bad influence in the congregation or potentially a bad influence in the congregation. That's the point, really. And also it gives data points to the governing body to look through or whatever. But you can't really fully trust the data that they release. You got to take them at their word with some of this stuff. Hey. This, this kid is like staring at her like she's weird. Yeah, I got that look a few times. I remember. Hey, Timmy. Want to see what I was reading on the bus? Sure. It doesn't go that way. Trust me. Does not happen like that. When you ask them if they want to know what you were reading on the bus, they say, no. No, I don't. And walk away. Jehovah. Jehovah? Yeah, that's God's name. No, it's not. It's Yahweh. It tells us about a happy future for the earth. Plus, there's a bunch of pictures in here to help you learn about him. Plus, there's a bunch of pictures in here. This is all propaganda. Wow, pretty cool. Thank you. Bye. I want to... 
And she even placed another book. She can put down on her little timesheet now. She placed two books. How about that? Just disgusting, dude. Thank you. Bye. I want to tell people at school about Jehovah. And you're going to turn yourself into a pariah. That's probably intentional. If I'm ever afraid, I know he'll help me. Because he's my friend. The end, I guess. It went faded to... Oh, look, we've got pictures of uh, kids from school now. Is this the kid that Caleb was based off of? I don't know. Okay, look, look, look. This kid's holding a My Book of Bible Stories right here. This is the updated version of the, uh, you know, the yellow book that I read when I was a little kid. Yeah, I guess it's the newer version of this one right here. This is this yellow one, right? Yeah, it's, I guess, got an updated cover. I wonder if it has the same number of horrific images in it. Like a woman and her child drowning or dying or being cursed or a donkey being beaten with a stick or I don't whatever other thing. God, the Bible is just really really graphic i just hope they didn't depict the song of solomon if you know you know you know what i'm wondering did they depict the song of solomon in the old 1978 book please tell me they didn't please tell me they didn't um this is second samuel first samuel second samuel uh let's see i'm looking who is this solomon builds a temple this is still in samuel maybe a little bit after solomon was Okay, Jezebel, that was a little bit later. We're coming up on Isaiah. These are the minor prophets. Jonah, which one? Hezekiah. Yeah, this is the king. Wait, 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 wait. He He's ripping his clothes apart. Is this uh the, the story that we just read about? He's only eight years old when he becomes king, uh, when he becomes king of the southern two tribes of Israel. Interesting. Man who's not afraid... I'm looking for the Song of Solomon. Jerusalem destroyed. So this should be the book of Daniel, right? When Jerusalem's destroyed. Um, handwriting on the wall. Yep, yep, yep. Mene, Mene, Tegel, and Parson. Mordecai and Esther. Okay, those are... That's a weird place to put that, but all right. I feel like it didn't belong there. That was at a totally different part of the Bible. An angel visits Mary. Wait, now we're in the New Testament? Are we in the New Testament? We are. We're in the New Testament. Look at this. We went from the rebuilding of the temple somewhere in the vicinity of 500, 600 BCE, and we just skipped 600 years. What about, what about the Song of Solomon? I want to know about the really, really dirty stuff in the Bible. They didn't include the dirty stuff? I mean, they included people being murdered brutally and thrown out windows and shit and eaten by whales, remember? They covered all that. Why didn't they cover the uh, the dirty stuff, the fun stuff? Hold on. Where where did the uh, picture of Jezebel being pushed out a window go? I want to go Lee. I want to end on that image right there. Okay. Yeah, they showed a woman being pushed out a window. Why didn't they show the Song of Solomon stuff? Come on. I want to find the really dirty stuff, for real. Anyway, this is, uh, <laughs> this picture is, like, burned into my retina, too, after all these years. Jezebel being pushed out a window. What a disturbing picture to show a five-year-old, right? What is wrong with these people? Anyways, yeah, Jehovah will help you be bold. Look, you're, you're showing it to the teacher. You're showing it to other kids that you're hanging out with. It's just, God, this propaganda is disgusting, dude. Absolutely disgusting. And remember, even babies are enemies of God. If you aren't baptized, if you aren't a baptized, believing Jehovah's Witness, active, door-knocking, preaching Jehovah's Witness, you're an enemy of God. Now, if we think about it, we're not born as friends of God because we're born as sinful offspring of Adam. Actually, if you think about it, we're born as enemies of God. Sometimes you'll hear people say of a little baby, Look at that little angel. But more accurate would be to say, look at that 
little enemy of God. That was governing body member Stephen Lett. That's insane. That is insane. Anyway, let me know what you think about all this in the comments. I've given you a lot to think about with this. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. Tell me what you think in the comments, okay?